Uh, all right. All right. Is it one of, was that is it one of those nights, Father? <laughs> Well, hi everyone and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight I'm gonna ask Cyprian and Father in honor of Father going and getting his nerd on in Washington, DC. I wanna ask uh, you guys, what has been your least favorite superhero movie so far? What's the one you've liked the least? Like, uh, it could be any of them. Doesn't have to be any of the just the Marvel stuff or anything. You know, I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna get this is like I'm saying this legitimately. I'm not saying this as like um I'm saying this legitimately. I am not saying this as with some political thing or anything like that, but Captain Marvel. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Didn't like it. Yeah, it wasn't very good. Didn't it was like weak. It. Yeah, it was just kind of weak. Just that every the, it didn't make sense. Like that, it's just the plot was just the the way it was executed. It just did to me. There were so many things. the The part where I was like, maybe I should turn this off. What? And I was just like, maybe I should just walk <laughs> walk away from this. Was there's the part where like her friend who was the fighter pilot with her, the test mm-hmm. pilot with her, yeah. and she's sitting there telling her daughter that they're gonna. Go first off overnight. That guy transforms the like military plane into a space worthy thing, like with the stuff in her garage. I was like, What? And then when she t- that was the first point where I was like, Wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> and then when she's sitting there with her daughter, her little daughter, and she's like telling her they're they're talking about they're trying to get her to go to space with them to fight against an alien race that can like destroy entire planets. And she's like encouraging her mom to go. She's like a seven year old girl. Who's like, yeah, you should, you should go mom. Like that. I might never see you again. And you might, and she, and, and then they, and then she goes and then her mom goes, I was like, maybe it's just time to turn this off right now. Like this, (laughs) I think maybe I just need to be done. This is not, this is no good. That was also the one where you found out that it was a, cat alien that caused Nick Fury a blurg a blurg no oh, that's a, a that's a, a blurg Farnog. it's like oh, a farnog. That, it's like no, a long it was a, blurg. it was a blurg oh is it a blurg i it's a blurg yeah it's <laughs> like a joke that, that um oh. other aliens know that that cat is an alien but for a long time anyway it doesn't matter yeah it's that one wasn't super good i dude i remember not liking it and then um also, I didn't really like it. Was that's a really good story arc in the comics? Is the uh, Kree scroll, uh, Kree scroll, the War. Kree's, yeah, yeah, and that that's like a really, really cool time in the comics, and it kind of just kind of brushed it over and blah blah blah. What about you, father? Green Lantern, Green Lantern, Green Lantern, yeah, yeah. Ryan Reynolds one, the Ryan Reynolds one. Yeah, that was just it was like Sinestro was the best part of that movie. Yeah. Okay. Did he turn? Vi- I've never seen it. Did he turn villain in that movie, or was he the still in a good guy in the movie? I think he was still kind of like, you know, he wasn't quite villain villain, you know. Sure. But I, I just it was bad. It's just there's. I remember just watching the theater, just being like, long before any type of superhero movie fatigue had even come close to setting in. And just being like, this is bad. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I still what haven't. About seen... for you? Oh, unabashedly, unequivocally, the Eternals, without a doubt. The I, mean, I still haven't seen it. Or... I still haven't seen it. <laughs> I still haven't seen it. So... I'm not gonna watch it. I, I'm not gonna watch it. 
on top of the fact that it's like it's what happens when you sacrifice like a story for a political agenda and mm. like a message that is just ramming down your throat the entire time and I don't know. There's like there's super there's super weird things about it. I think father would see them instantly like they come to Earth. They're aliens. Right. But they've been here the whole time. Right. right. And they come and they give man the technology for bronze. Right. Um, and then they help invent one of the dudes helps invent the atomic bomb. Um, so they're demons. They're yeah demons. let's just i mean let's just be yeah. let's just be demons. straight up about it and then not only that <laughs> but like we've talked about this before a little bit but the one black character is gay too so they had to feminize. of course you got to get your double dip on always <laughs> always dip. there was i won't go on and on about this but there was nothing lovable about any one of those characters none of them like I couldn't even really remember the portrayal of any one of them except for the black knights in it. And the black knight will be cool later on once they do it right. Um, but like towards the end of the movie, there's infighting um, amongst the eternals. And like one of them's like, I've always wanted to do this to you. Like he's just been like resenting the heck. And I've like, I've not got that once from this entire movie. Have, has that earned that interaction is not earned you've not set that up in any way i have no idea how these characters feel about each other there's a lot of that i think that's a modern that's just modern filmmaking at this point it's like form it's just it's all the form they've they, the screenwriters have the form down but they don't actually understand like how to execute it yeah yeah, it's like an equation, really like in different variables. Exactly. And, yeah, and then you'll just end up with relatively the same thing. Exactly. I could go on and on. I won't. It's just a really terrible movie. It's just like it. It makes like the theater release of Batman versus Superman look like The Godfather. It's just like absolutely horrendous. Wow. Then I had a great it. conversation about that with shout out to Richard Rowland. We were talking about that this weekend. And uh, Doxicon was like, you know, how bad, especially this, you know, I, I can't remember which wave it is or which phase it is in Marvel. It's causing you to actually look back at things like Batman and Superman and Snyder Cut and be like, yeah, this isn't bad. <laughs> you know, it's causing, it's <laughs> causing you to really look back here. and yeah. appreciate stuff, you know, so. No, I, I agree. I mean, I'm ready. And this is not a... Uh, superhero podcast but james gunn i don't know father have you heard that james gunn was given the dc universe mm -mm. the dude from guardians of the galaxy that directed the and then mm -hmm. the new suicide squad mm -hmm. and the new kevin feige or feige or whatever his name is from marvel they he like gave him the dc universe like okay you do what you want fix it like go and fix it please oh. so. We'll see what happens. Maybe I'll have to start seeing a DC movie. I wonder what kind of paycheck that is for a guy. Like, what are they, you know what I mean? Unimaginable to me. Unimaginable. Like, tens of millions at least. Tens of millions of dollars at least. Yeah. I mean, generally with those, with the producers, like it, like if you're going to be executive producer of like one of these, of, if like it's going to be like a whole big thing, what they do is they, it's just like, it's kind of like investing in a company. So like wh whoever's the company behind it, the big studio or whatever that's green lighting it, they just like say, oh, well, here's $150 million for this movie. And then it's like, whatever you have left over is to the executive producers, right? So it's like, you kind of pay yourself, but at the same time, the more you pay yourself, the less your budget to spend on other things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's... uh. It's a racket. Which it's is funny because at the end of the day, it's like, if it fails, it's like, well, you get to walk away with the cash because like, yeah, that's right. like real. crying all that's over right. the bank. Yep. Um, yeah. I just have to say this and then we can move on. The Batman movie, the last one, was so good. Yeah. I was just sitting here thinking about it. I was like, that's just such a great movie. That was so, so, so good. 
Um, okay, so I actually we hadn't really discussed this, but there's actually I have like three really solid questions. One of them is about what we had already talked about. Okay. That Green and I and Father had talked about. Um, but I have two more, which I actually just got, and I'm actually bumping them up the queue. Sounds good. Let's get into it. Yeah, because I think that they're really, really good. So the first one, old friend of the show, Jeremy. Uh, sent us and um, asked us about this concept of pandemic amnesty. So this was an interesting phenomenon whose zeitgeist seems to have already come and gone uh, last week. It seems like it's not really, I haven't really seen too much about it recently anymore. It seemed like somebody threw it out and then both sides are like, absolutely not. And they kind of like, all right, well, let's, let me just go ahead and take that back in then. But Maybe you guys have a little bit more insight into it. Um, I don't think it's gone. You don't, don't think, think so? Mm-mm, mm-mm. I don't think it's gone at all. Um, I do think it was. So so let me for for the whoever was living under a rock and doesn't know. <laughs> I was uh, at the time. <laughs> father did not know. <laughs> we talked about Hold it. And father's like, I don't uh, know. Wait, let make me the host again and let me sh- or or let me share screen if you would. And I'll make... and I'll pull it up. I think you just go to share screen. There should be a little thing next to the share, maybe. Uh huh. And then okay. just let me share it. Allow participants to share screen. So basically, nope, still can't. Basically, there was an article in the Atlantic by this woman. Her name is um, Emily. Emily Oster. Emily Oster, or Oster. I don't really know. I can't share the screen, but oh well. Uh, Emily Oster. I'll put the link in the in the description so people can see it. And the title is Let's Declare a Pandemic Amnesty. Let's focus on the future and fix the problems we still need to solve. Now, the interesting thing about this woman, Emily Oster, is that she was like, you go back, people just dredged up her tweets. Like she was, she's like some kind of a doctor or something, but she was calling for the most. She's vicious. She was calling for masks. She was calling for like mandates. She was calling for all kinds of things, right? And her whole setup here, let me see if it's kind of in the in the little sub thing here. It's like, um, let's do, uh, let's, let's just forgive each other for what we did when we were in the dark about this whole thing. That's, that's what she's saying. Which I read as for I forgive all the ignorance from a certain side. Like that's kind of how I read it was like. See, this is and this is my issue. Is with this word amnesty. And that's what I was hoping we could talk about, because it's like amnesty as versus forgiveness and amnesty as versus what's going to happen with repentance, because the whole idea of amnesty, like the concept of amnesty and why this comes up and why it's such a weird word for her to choose, but it's. It's in the Atlantic, okay? So those words are chosen carefully. Like, that's that's about words, right? Amnesty is what you give to somebody who fought against you in a war. <laughs> like, so that basically, like, if there's a civil war, like, for instance, there was an amnesty for Confederate soldiers after the Civil War. And the idea is something like, well... You could have won or we could have won. There's some level of moral ambiguity here. And it just so happens that we happen to to win. But in order to move forward now for you to like be like integrate into this thing and accept it, we're going to say, look, you were a soldier on the other side. You fought, you know, if the roles were reversed, I would. It, there's like a moral equivalence, in other words. Mm-hmm. Right. And so amnesty, the idea behind amnesty is like, we will just never talk about this again. That's kind of the idea of an amnesty, right? And really like the legal idea of the amnesty is somebody has committed a crime. They are liable to be taken to trial and liable to be punished. But without changing the laws, you basically pardon them. It's a general pardon, right? That's what an amnesty is. It's a gen- So it means you broke the law according to the letter of the law, but in the spirit of the law or in, in my, magna- my magnanimousness as the sovereign, I'm going to just look the other way, mm. right? The problem that I see in this whole situation is like, 
one, there's no forgiveness being asked for. No. Because they're, she's not even going to say what I'm like, well, tell me what you did wrong then. And should you have done it wrong? Really what I see is like, they view it, the people asking for the amnesty or when this was floated as like, there's a war going on. We lost this battle. Let us just go on with our with our day and we'll just for, forget this, this who, ever happened, whatever damage we did. Who lost the battle? I'm sorry, according to this narrative, who lost the battle? Like the anti- well, they're, well, what they're acknowledging is that the COVID thing was at, at the very least hyper beyond inflated and uh, accurate, if so, not whoa. Just flat out. okay that's so, not how i read that wow that's okay that's interesting all right well, I mean, well hold on let me let me read I, i'll read the first little bit and then because it makes sense right so here's the first little bit it, it, it'll, it'll make sense to say what the context is she says in april 2020 with nothing else to do my family took an enormous number of hikes we all wore cloth masks that i had made myself we had a family hand signal which the person in front would use if someone was approaching on the trail and we needed to put on our masks. once when another child got too close to my then four-year-old son on a bridge he yelled at her social distancing these precautions were totally misguided in april 2020 no one got the coronavirus from passing someone else hiking Outdoor transmission was vanishingly rare. Our cloth masks made out of old bandanas wouldn't have done anything anyway. But oh. the thing is, we didn't know. I, I have been go now. ahead, go ahead, oh, go ahead. Okay. No, no, now no. you get it. I'm just, I, it's clicking. This, this is totally has taken another realm. I had not seen. I thought mm-hmm. this was bowing down to the ignorant Trumpers nope. and saying, like, look. You guys didn't get this one right, but let's do it again. So it's basically saying the stuff that we've been saying, they're coming in and saying like, yeah, there was some validity to some of the stuff that you were complaining about. Let's just all know. No, they're not saying that. They're not saying there was validity to anything people were complaining about. What they're saying is, well, we got some of the things wrong. Right. But not that we not were complaining that, about, like the whole like yelling social distancing and stuff mm-hmm. like that. We well, like, she didn't say social distancing was a problem. Mm. She said that the problem was the way they went about her, it. That her child yelling social distancing was maybe a little over the top. Yeah. Or she's not saying that masks don't work. She's saying, well, we didn't know that cloth masks made from a bandana wouldn't this work. This whole thing just woo in my mind it's all different now i'm still not sure i got quite got a grasp on it but let's move forward let's not it's, wait it's basic yeah it's basically the idea that it's like just anything that we did just we did it out out of an overabundance of caution is basically what she says there like yeah we went a little overboard but it was just out of our overabundance of caution it's not like but the most important part i think out of it the most important part and it's relevant to us here is the underlying presupposition is nobody knew. Nobody knew what the long-term effects of this would be. Nobody knew any of this. And I'm like, wait a minute, tweets from March. (laughs) You know what I mean? Orthodox elders being like, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. You know what I mean? Like, this is going to be bad. This is going to be a problem. And so it's like, no, you weren't in the dark. And not only were you not in the dark, every one of us who was saying, hey, don't do this, history rhymes, from all strata of society, you you banned us. Mm -hmm. You sought to silence us. You said we were killing grandma. What does it say? Keep doubling down. down. Keep doubling down. And father did link a funny cartoon which is a, some a couple of dudes. Can you share it? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll oh, that. can you share it, Cyprian? I can try. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Can you, do I have screen sharing ability? All right. So tell me, <laughs> walk me through. Lots, hey, lots of Andrew, you're like the COVID amnesty guy. You're Why not- don't you just can you can you give me back host? Can you click on participants and click on me and tell me tell me host reclaim? Absolutely. Oh, I can just record, and I'll just. Okay, I'll slam those two together. I'll slam those two recordings together. Okay. Now I can share. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. I had to reclaim the host. Father, you shared yes. something? Oh, yes. Did you see this before? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find this. I've seen, I've seen it. Let me see if I can find it online. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe not. I'll have to download it. It's a well. Can maybe I can just hold it up to the camera? Yeah, sure. See if that works. Let's see. Tell me, you guys, if you can see this. Well, probably pretty yeah. bad. Not real good. No but the, good. Ah! That's that's the story. It, it's two two um, obviously inquisitors in Salem or whatever, and one of them they're burning two women, and it's and he's out. Turns out they're not witches after all. And as the women continue to burn, one of the dudes yells at the fire. Mistakes were made on both sides. That's on it. Both yeah. sides. On, on both, both sides. sides. <laughs> on both yeah. sides. What what I found interesting about this was. Mm -hmm. Even homeboy um, Matt Walsh, who I'm not the biggest fan of, I love a lot of the things that he says. I, you know, I have not seen it, but I, I trust I will. I probably would absolutely love his "What Is a Woman" documentary. It's good. I love what he says to people, but he's also like a very angry, bitter Catholic dude. Um, said no, absolutely not. Forgiveness is not in the cards. Not till we see. Uh, Fauci before like a military tribunal, you know, like not till like, um, you know, never forget the people who made your children wear masks, never forget the people who fired you, like because you wouldn't get the poke or whatever, never forget this stuff. Like, no, we will remember this stuff. And I'm like, see, that's the, those are the, and it's on both sides as well. I mean, it's, you know, remember the person who refused to wear masks, who you could later got sick from remember the people who like refuse to get the poke or whatever so it's but it's, this is the reason why this project exists exactly because we saw we saw this mm -hmm. this is the moment here's the here's one of one of the moments yeah one of the moments of of this project that this project exists so father this is th so i've been very eager to talk about this because what what matt walsh is doing is he's doing revenge Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think what we want to talk about is revenge versus repentance. Mm -hmm. And how do we because a lot of people are having this as I've spoken with people, as I've said things, a lot of people are having a problem with with. What is the context in which I forgive? How do I forgive? What is the process by which I forgive? Is the there father. something required of the other party? All of these things. Try and keep it to a tight 20, though, because there's a really great question after this. No, no, dude. This... No, no, no. I, I was halfway kidding. There is a great question. <laughs> but and then also, I just want to say really quick, I didn't see any of this stuff coming on the wall, like any of the writing on the wall. Like I so I'm here to just react and be like, oh, sure. Oh, I see that because this is nothing I predicted. I My prediction was still like by this time, there would be covid copters flying around with like soldiers jumping out with armed with like guns that shot the vaccine or something so well, october was going to be a crisis one way or the other like which way it was going to go october was going to mark who knows which way it was going to go but october was going to mark a crisis so it looks like this is what the crisis and it looks like it's a revenge crisis is what we've got on it with the election coming up all those things yeah. anyway father i yeah i i mean I think the thing, honestly, is like um, the sentiment, like the seeds of resentment, the sentiments of, you know, revenge and all of these things are, um, it doesn't take much to set these things in play, right? So let me, let me kind of like take a step. Let me try to see if I can, if I can articulate how I'm seeing it. So from our perspective, we can we can make the mistake of trying to give too much credit to have too much of the minutia being orchestrated. Because it really doesn't take much to set these kind of um, opposing sides, this polarization, it doesn't take much to set it in play, right? And, and I think the thing is, is that when we, when we take a step back and, you know, I'll just be really frank, the real problem was with a guy like Matt Walsh. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Because he's, you know, he's representing 
Christianity. You know what I mean? Like he's he is on, you know, he's he's on the platform. Um and a lot of good work. A lot of I mean I like a lot of what he says, but this is this is where it gets tough. It's like, you know, and this is I guess part of this is part of conversation we've had, but maybe this is the night we go in a little bit in depth on it. But it's like, do you just join side with it's like, look, it's a war. I can't get too nuanced with it. You know what I mean? Better with you, angry Christian who wants vengeance, than with, you know, clown pedo, you know, abomination dude, right? And and that's that's I guess why we're here. Cause like, does it have to be that way? I don't know if it does, because that pull to their side, um, of not being able to discern it, that's a trap. So that being said, let's let's look at this, right? So what's the problem with vengeance? Well, obviously, first and foremost, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, but why is that? The reason for that is, is because we don't see everything with God's perspective. So it, again, this, like all this connects because if you just take one side or one aspect of it, you know, it, it falls flat pretty quickly. But, you know, what is the ultimate aim of, of this life here? What is what is happening in the arc of world history? What is happening in the arc of, of American history? What is happening in the arc of Western society? What is happening in the arc of, you know, the kind of pandemic and all that stuff? Well, you know, although the enemy, the principalities, the powers, they're using and moving things for a specific end. God is also achieving something. Mm -hmm. And so remember the apocalypse, the revelation, the uncovering. And what's being seen is, you know, what is your real aim and goal here, right? Because if your aim and goal is righteousness, you know, the kingdom of God, all that stuff, then we got to be really careful when we start saying things like we won't forget, we're going to this and that, because on the, on, on one hand, you are strictly affirming, not that that matters, this doesn't really matter, but it's still a point I'll bring up. You're affirming whatever critiques were being, you know, thrown at you, you know, see, you are a, a fascist or you are a Nazi or you were, you know, a hypocrite, like all the things that are thrown at quote unquote, religious people, right? You begin to affirm it because what you're not demonstrating are the things that reveal the divinity that's supposed to be within the Christian religion. Mm. You're just putting forward the morality. You're just putting forward the kind of like social, you know, conducts and structures that keep people in line, right? And so by doing that, you're, you are nurturing and fostering further not just bifurcation of like of the country and society right but you're you're really in many ways you're working as a if you are a christian you're working as a disobedient son from my perspective okay. because you're not really like at that point in time matt walsh you know not to call him out but you know if that is the case he's not representing the interests of his master of his king or you know what i mean he's 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 representing the interests of people who may share some particular moral you know ideas some things like that but you know vengeance and all and getting into all that um that's a that's a very dangerous trap because i'll just say this and i'll, I'll be quiet on it because of what it does to the soul of the people that are involved with it but i mean that that's ultimately what we're getting at right so does that mean like we just act like nothing happens that's not what i'm saying at all by the way but what i'm saying is is that vengeance and accountability aren't the same thing right um you can there is a way forward in in account of holding people accountable and things like that but we but you gotta be careful because that fine line of moving into like vengeance and then vengeance leads to like atrocities and then atrocities, 
you know, you're no better than who you're fighting against. You know what I mean? You're just going to win side. That's, so, what, that's what you end up with. Isn't this a little bit like St. Peter cutting off the guard's ear a little bit, like in the Garden of Gethsemane? Um, because, like, he grabbed the sword and chopped off the dude's ear and Christ was like, oh, do, 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 do. And then, like, healed the ear. Like, it was, like, supposedly a good action in a way that was to be defending Christ, but not of Christ. I mean, maybe. I feel like it's... We could, is there another we lesson there? We could try to fit it, but like, I, I, no, because this is like vengeance. This isn't self defense. This is, you know, Peter's but, actions there are in the throw of, are in the throes of, you know, Christ being actively, you know, arrested, attacked. And, you know, it does apply in the sense that the Lord, you know, was, was you know, like, hey, you don't know what spirit you're of. Right. Like all these things I taught you. Okay. That we're taught what we're talking about now is like, don't forget. Don't forget. Like, like I will never forgive you. Um, you know what I mean? And I will just say this. I haven't read, I don't know Matt Walsh's response. So it, it could be, I could hear it and be like, oh, it's totally different. You know what I mean? But from from I'm just going off of we can take him out of the picture and just say that if we start moving towards this this idea of don't forget this, don't forget that, without the qualification of saying, hey, you know what? Okay, you want amnesty, you want things to move forward. We're here. Here's here's what we got to look at. Right. This is this is what accountability looks like. Versus just flat out like, nope. The second I get my chance, I'm cutting your throat when you're asleep. Well, the latter was the sentiment, right? The latter was the sentiment that that I saw. Like mm -hmm. the sentiment that I saw, the response to this amnesty thing was almost exclusively. I mean, there were a minority of people who were, and, and what I was trying to say publicly was I think like leaning in this direction. And it really, for me, I realized that the only reason I was even able to lean in that direction was because of my conversion. Mm -hmm. And because of my, me starting to understand repentance, to understand like, wait a minute, we've got like two choices here. We've got like the punitive and the remedial, right? Like remedy. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, like, if we're just going to do punitive, so like you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. And now the scales are balanced, but there's been no remedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, no, I would much rather no punitive. Like, let the punitive be in God's hands, mm -hmm. but let's take what you did and you remedy it now. So, for instance, like that Emily Oster person. OK, all those tweets you had where you were saying mandates and all of this, all those things do you now know to be false? Why don't you tweet that they were false? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tweet against people who are still spreading it? Which Why is don't that, you that, use the platform that you use to, 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 to remedy this? Which to get to the question of the person, that's repentance. The repentance, the re here's what it looks like. The repentance would be, hey, stop. Stop the doubling down, stop the whatever, and use the same platform, use the same energy that you did to try to stir the thing up and say, this was wrong, and I was wrong, and like, this is what we got to do to, you know, this is what I need, this is what I need to do to make things right that that's what needs to happen right and and if that and if that happens then the you know accordingly the response should be you know what okay yeah you know like let, let's let's try to have peace you know what i mean instead of just like nope nope doesn't matter what you do now you know like second again the chance i'm going to squish you like a bug that that can't be the response you know if the squish you like a bug and and this is why the the matt walsh thing to to me is so like i have the pit of my stomach have it. i haven't seen it i haven't seen it so i, I have, mean I, i'm not i'm not even to, i'm just saying that that yeah. as a as a as an idea the reason that i have a problem with it is because it's like it's denying the person a chance at repentance and to me that's an affront to christ yes and the problem with it is though is if you're a christian yes like exactly. like if you're if you're not a christian you know, if you're, you know, I mean, if you're a heathen, like, like I mean, 
Can I say it? Like, yeah, you can. Oh, okay. uh, he's as acceptable. I'll yeah. Uh, then, then I mean, what? I don't. We don't expect anything of you. You know what I mean? If you're, you know, like, you know, if you're, you know, Habib Hijab, it's like, okay, yeah, of course you're gonna want to murder and torture people. That's what we expect out of you and your religion, whatever. But like, if you're a Christian, then. So Especially the, if you're Catholic, you know what I mean? Small C, capital C, whatever. Like that's this that's, is his this is his response. This is somebody wrote it out. Matt Walsh response to the left asking for bandit pandemic amnesty. Move on. I'll move on after there have been military tribunals. I'll move on when Fauci and his comrades are tried, uh are tried and convicted for crimes against human humanity. That's when I, we can move on. So Maybe it's a little which means not, execution, by the way, is what he's saying. I mean, tr yeah, treason or crimes against humanity is not like a uh, a 120 with a no, fight at a military tribunal. Crimes against humanity means you're hung, yeah. That's so that's what he's implying. It's I'm gonna take it they're dead that that's true because I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I trust true. it is. But well, that's what happened at Nuremberg, yeah. Oh, fair enough, that's what he's talking about, fair enough. So, okay, so then. Father, so what are what is the appropriate response? Like, well, like I just we just laid it out what it is, but I I would just kind of add this is that can't be like the go to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, cause, cause I mean, right? It it was it a tweet? I don't know. It's like the medium of itself is is conducive to being hyperbolic, and you know you want to kind of get a a statement that's going to grab attention. I get all that, but. If we're talking, well, what is the real world anymore, right? But if we're if we're talking about like, okay, as Christians, like the way forward is to say, like, yeah, you know, like I was just saying earlier, like if these things are put forward in regards of like there's there's actual repentance being demonstrated, you know, like like real repentance, then the proper response would be to try to you know, acknowledge that and, and to build off of that, right? And I guess if we're talking on a social level, then you begin to participate with those people who are repenting and trying to find a way to actually, as kumbaya as this sounds, find some larger measure of social healing. Because, I mean, here, here's, here's the thing about it. I mean, world peace, whatever, but, like, our country, you know, is so divided and fractured, it's like... If you've contributed to it on a no, on a national level because of your platform, then you know as a Christian, and like in that position, someone's actually demonstrating some repentance. Then to show some goodwill towards that and to try to participate in that. I mean, as futile as it may seem, which coming off of the you know like my talk at at the Doxicon convention, I'm I'm really big on this right now in regards of doing something even though it seems futile you know what i mean like i mean that to me that's a very uniquely christian you know quality or character trait you yeah. know is to do the right thing even though it's seemingly futile absolutely yeah father i've been I, and, and andrew i've been thinking about this one as well just from a purely pragmatic because i mean powers and principalities man my mind mm -hmm. my heart always goes there now mm -hmm. but you know, with that response and with the idea of like people being split down the middle and being fractured and like, what does that mean moving forward? Just as as somebody, and I think there's probably a lot of people watching this and, you know, those of us who absolutely did not take the woke vote for like spiritual, but also physical. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us are seeing that there's like something wrong right now. Mm -hmm. It appears that there's like, that it did something very bad. And, and it seems that as time goes on, it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. We could be coming to a real global health crisis that is like something that we have like in a few years from now, never that seen. is gonna be something like we have never seen and could never imagine. And it's really going, it's, it's like, do we hit that? If we, if, if we, like myself, I believe that that's coming. I believed that that was coming for a long time since I knew that they were going to start injecting people with the experimental thing, right? It seemed to me that like we're this the, the, the chances of this being bad is pretty pretty high. 
And my question is like, how do we meet that? Do we meet that divided against these people who, who, who are our brothers and sisters who were misled, mm -hmm. many of them who mm -hmm. were lied to, mm -hmm. who took this thing. Right. And now we're going to be cleaning up bodies in the streets. Like, are we, how are we going to meet them? Like, wouldn't it be better to meet this crisis with us looking at each other like you were tricked, right? Let's deal with this. Mm -hmm. Let's understand that like, and, and for them to be able to come to repentance in, in the time that that happens, right? As opposed to people cheering, oh, you, you dummy. And because like, what is Matt, what, what is Matt Walsh with his attitude now? How does he feel about that when people start dropping dead more than they are? Yeah, I mean that, I mean, it's just, it's a absolute statement of saying that's an unchristian attitude. You know, it's like the scripture is clear about not rejoicing when your enemy. <laughs> the yeah. scripture is really clear about it. And there's, there's just nothing Christian about it, you know? So someone could argue like, well, that's not what's being said. What's being said is there's a measure like accountability. Okay. And I'll, I'll move off of Matt Walsh because, you know, it, to give the man the ability to kind of clarify, you know, just, all we can do is read between the lines on our little, you know, small show, whatever we're doing. But I, I would just say that sentiment, though, is is really important because, again, you know, getting to the heart of it. And we are either bringing in and manifesting, forgive me how it sounds, but we are either representing and being ambassadors of Christ and and being a means by which, you know, Christ is manifested in the world or we're not. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to make it. I know that's not as entertaining, but it's really to me that black and white. Yeah. So that, that's why, you know, I think I think we can get or I can get so kind of like strict with um, or so stringent on the, the royal path of it, because that's what the Lord calls us to a narrow. It's the narrow road. Right. And we just at not ad nauseum. Right. You being right doesn't mean that it's of God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like the, the measure in which you judge, you shall be judged. And I'll just say that the measure. Which, and so I think there's, there's something to be said for really understanding that, um, you know, we got to be careful. One of the problems with, the, with temptation from the right too, is just it, the easiest thing is to, is to cease to see people's humanity. And that's that's fundamentally demonic thinking. Like the demons are all about being like correct. You know what I mean? The it, the demonic mindset is all about you know, this is unjust. This is incorrect. You know, I mean, the accuser. You know what I mean? Like that's that's the nature. So God forbid we would find ourselves in in the in the seat of the accuser. You know, and, and not having mercy towards people. I I just think that's. For me, that's definitely the place where I'm going to be working hard to to find myself at is to, you know, and this isn't about becoming soppy and like, you know, nothing matters, but it's just about like doing doing the best to, to keep on that middle path, to keep on that narrow road of, you know, maintaining a Christ-like disposition regardless of what's happening, you know? Yeah, I mean, because like at any time during the crucifixion, Christ could have Dr. Manhattan to everybody oh. out, you know, without without even yeah. You know. And, and and justifiably so. Justifiably so. I mean, that's again that's my God, you know, of the mercy, you know, this is when so Saint Sophrain talks about essentially paraphrasing so much of his work. It's like if people, this is still on, if, if people knew the humility of Christ, like it's it's beyond like we we just it's divine. We don't even understand it, you know. Um, it's interesting you talked about that, Father, because um, uh, you talked about either you're amb you're an ambassador of Christ or you're not. There's kind of nothing neutral, and like that kind of clicked for me that like so much of what the world preaches now is it's neutral. Like Christ doesn't care if what you do, you know, Christ doesn't care if you you know got five husbands and two wives, you know, and you guys all raise your whatever your your children that way or whatever like and that like the increase of like the narrative of there are neutral actions is like confirmation that there are no neutral actions you know so um yeah so anyway 
Um, I have this other great question here, and we don't have to be done with that, but I do actually want to make sure that I get this one. Um, was uh, this is from Simeon? I just got this, but I I have been meaning to ask Father about this for a really long time. But Simeon sent in an email, so can you um, can Father talk about the demon of noonday? Mm. Uh, and then acedia, acedia, is that yeah. what it is, Father? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'd like to hear what Acadia. he knows. Some people pronounce it Acadia, but yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to hear what he knows, and if he has any practical tips for no, uh, practical tips for how to know if one is being tempted by this demon and how to fight it. So, Father, mm-hmm. noonday demon. Let's get into that for just a minute. Okay. So, yeah, it's there's a couple of things. You know, the demon in the noonday is uh. Something that particularly affects monastics and clergy, people who have a um, disposition and vocation of, of spiritual work and prayer. It, it's the core of it is a kind of sloth and slothful disdain for for spiritual for spiritual um, work, um, and it's often um, overlapped and intermingled with despondency, depression. But acedia, acadia is like very very kind of particular thing right so like someone suffering from the doldrums and uh you know despondency and depression may not necessarily be suffering from it right because um the thing with the seed is like it has some pretty interesting ways in which that it affects people so for instance um one person can come to me and say like, man, I'm just depressed. I can't get up in the morning. Um, I'm not really feeling like I'm into anything, you know? Um, and then I'll be like, okay, well, are you eating? <laughs> you know, are you, are you, are you getting vitamin? I'm being serious. Are you getting vitamin D? You know what I mean? Um, are you sleeping properly? Like, and start, and start looking at those things. Um, and then they're like, okay, yeah, I'm doing that, this and that, but it, it gets more particular about like spiritual matters. I'm like, okay, well, then then we'll consider kind of acedia because acedia, uh, it can actually look like, um, you know, a workaholic can actually suffer from that too, you know? So for instance, um you know that you have your prayer rule or you have something that, you know, you need to be studying, you know, your spiritual work. And it's just like, you get down to your studio or whatever. It's like, oh, I forgot. I have to go scrub the bottom of the dog's kennel with my toothbrush. I've been meaning to do that for six years, you know, and all of a sudden you have this energy to go do that. Right. That can actually be very much a symptom of that. Right. There was some author, father, forgive me. There was some author who said, And I love this quote, and I just wanted to throw it in there. I'm forgetting who the author was, but he said, "Uh, my house is never so clean as when I have a novel that I have to write. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't know what to do. Set out to go do some prayer. Suddenly you'll get about 50 ideas of stuff you're doing instead. So, yeah. So so when you look at like the Desert Fathers and you look at it traditionally, like the Demon in Noonday, um. Well, like if you're reading Evagoras, you know, the Ratheos, it's like, oh, you know, in the middle of the day, the monastic is, you know, kind of given over to, you know, various feelings of disdain and sloth. And, and that that's all there. Um, there's actually a, a book that goes the other direction with it. Um, it's a fairly thorough and exhaustive work that looks at it kind of more from more clinical contemporary sense of like, despondency and and clinical depression but again in the book of the the title of the book is the demon of the noonday but it isn't exactly correct because it's at it's it's focusing on one aspect whereas you know it the it technically gets more into this kind of like slothful disdain for one's spiritual spiritual life that's why i was saying earlier it 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 affects people who have a predilection or a vocation towards like prayer, um, you know, more often than, than something else. All kinds of people suffer from despondency. 
less people than you might realize, you know, it, it's it's more particular for CDN. Now, there's also this aspect of like distraction. There's there's all these things that are interplaying in it. And you could make the argument, which I'm not going to disagree with, that a CD is the kind of like hidden passion of our generation or of this time period now because of the incre I mean, the exponentially huge wave of distractions that we're all swimming through mm -hmm. and that that those distractions have a particularly like spiritual like aim or focus when you start thinking about the things that we're distracted with it's funny how strongly or how quickly you can find a strong correlation to the core things that they're distracting us from our spiritual nature does mm -hmm. that make sense what i just said right yeah yeah there are things targeting specifically like the spiritual aspect of things. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I would say a couple of core things to look at. Um, don't just focus on this thought of like being depressed, respondent, focus on distraction. What are you being distracted from? Right. If you want to kind of diagnose something like that, that's one of the best ways to see because the CD can take all kinds of different ways. It can manifest on different kinds of different ways too um but the key thing is like a, a distraction and a kind of slothful a distracted and slothful disdain for one's you know spiritual health that sure. that's that's the key because despondency on its own is a, is a different thing so practical stuff to do is like you know saint moses he says go to your cell your cell will teach you everything the cd is interesting because it's one of those it's one of the one of the passions you like their only remedies to hit it head on like you, you have to like hit it head on directly. And, um, you know, people who don't, I just, I've seen it so many times, they, it's a long, hard struggle. It's one of those things where when it comes on you and you've been diagnosed with it, you know, if you don't hit it head on and deal with it there, you're in for a real long haul battle. But the good news is if you, if you think you're struggling with it, you go to spiritual father and like, that's, it's like confirmed and like, whatever medicine you're given, if you actually hit it hard, like, you know, chemo, you hit it hard and fast and directly, you know, you can really banish that demon. Generally speaking, what would be like a remedy you'd give for that father? Just generally speaking, like extra Psalms, prostrations. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, well, this is tough, but generally speaking, like, yes, um, prostrations, you know, all these things, but like, interestingly enough, I, I would give, um prayer that's of a more kind of creative and thankful nature because thanksgiving is one of the best ways i've seen to really deal with this because thanksgiving kind of knocks out part of the despondent facet of this demon like it's kind of like i got a couple different things that are that are made up um and the despondent aspect of it, the depression aspect of it is definitely tackled with the Thanksgiving. But the thing about the Thanksgiving is it can actually activate certain aspects within a person's soul that can lead them to inspiration. And that inspiration is what's needed to really kind of like keep hammering at it, you know? Hmm. 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 I, I get that in terms of, because it seems like some aspect of acedia would be, um, kind of a and i guess this would be like a logos me but like kind of a, a creeping idea that your spiritual life was somehow some sort of like a chore rather than mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. something that you were glad that you could do and that the thanksgiving would activate that 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 gladness exactly. for you. i mean that thought is like number three of the top five like low gives me that that comes with this is like this is such a chore this is such a burden um and yeah like that's exactly it even if yeah. it's like sorry even if it's like underpinned with like dragging yourself to your prayer corner and like like really kind of dreading the amount of prayer that you've had to go into I'm just yeah. asking. I'm asking for a friend, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asking for so yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean. Part of that, though, also too, is where this is where hubris. This is where kind of like, um, you know, you got to watch out for the vanity to come in because 
sometimes that's you're like what what like that situation have you gone and actually asked for your prayer rule to be adjusted have you gone and you know what i mean because here's the thing there's a difference between slogging it out with a blessing versus slogging it out like white knuckling it and this and this and that right and that is oftentimes what can lead someone into a cedia interestingly enough is actually overexertion right and so when people take on more burnout than, spiritual burnout, burnout. Yeah. yeah when people take on more than they are blessed to do more than they should you know they can they can begin to experience that you know mm. that's an interesting that's an interesting question father and i don't think anything that we've ever talked about but something that i find interesting as well as i especially as i hear um you know, people talking about elders, especially like fools for Christ mm -hmm. and recounting stories of them, just this, this idea that, and it's, it, it, it's, it's so very strange, but this idea that in orthodoxy, which is considered to be so stringent that at times, you know, that it would be, that things would be removed in order to like that, that less could be more. Yeah, it's quite right. the opposite. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. It's quite the opposite. I mean, it's the paradox, right? Because on the one hand, orthodoxy is a maximalist religion, but the maximalism doesn't come in in regards of um the expectation that you can do all. It's just understanding the height of what's there to almost kind of like engender authentic humility, right? But the reality is is that um he who the sun sets free is free indeed and so the the function the purpose of our tradition isn't to be in bondage to things that are self-aggrandizing and and self-righteous they're there to facilitate repentance and the health of the soul and so often it is the lesser but more qualitative work because you know this is what people do like you know, they want to have, they think that like, you know, beware the guy who tells you how, how you know, big his prayer rule is because, you know, th that guy will also have his prayer rule taken from him. Uh, speaking from experience, you know, like, uh -huh. like, like that's, you, you know, you, you got to really watch that. And so um, the most powerful prayer we have is like five words, right? You know, and I can, we can even condense it down to three, you know, probably to one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like mercy. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. Mercy. Jesus. Mercy. No. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Cause I could, I mean, you but, can ask mercy from anybody, but Jesus, but, you know, yes, like, yes. but there is a difference between that and using the Lord's name in vain. Right. Father, mm -hmm. we've talked about this a little oh. bit more. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me, let me just throw this out for everybody. I don't know if I've said this in the, in the public square, but uh, you know, Father Turbo's corner or whatever you want to call it. If, if you, if you want to see some, if you want to see some growth in your prayer or you feel like you're stagnating, ask yourself, do you curse? Because if if you're if you use foul language, if you curse, even if you murmur under your breath, it's going to hinder your prayer. So if you know, I'm just giving people pre tips tonight, right? If if you want to like grow in your prayer, then start really watching your words, watch your cursing. And I, and I don't just mean cuss words like f bombs and s words, but like, are you cursing people? Are you uttering curses or, you know what I mean? If you're murmuring curses, thing like that, it's going to affect your prayer. Can salt water and fresh water come from the same source? Man, I never even yeah. thought about the grumbling a curse at someone. Uh, it's just like, man, that's, that's, that's pretty brutal, actually. Like when you're someone you're... who mumbles, someone who, someone who mumbles, curses, complains and grumbles, their prayers will always be hindered. You know what's in, what's interesting, Father, that you mentioned that, and this was a completely unexpected, and it's and so visceral, and I've often thought about it and wondered about it, but like, I was known as someone who had a an absolutely foul mouth, like every other word from me was a curse word, but 
since beginning a life of prayer and since my conversion, it actually, those words have actually started to disgust me, mm -hmm. which is weird. Yeah, for real. Like to where, and, and it wasn't, and it's no like desire to be thought of as like a nice guy or something like that, but it's like really, even even hearing someone just just use uh, God's oh, name in vain, it's just me. like it just grates on me now. It's forgive weird. Me, <laughs> I don't want to go too much into this. Is gonna you didn't have the Holy Spirit before? The Holy Spirit was you know maybe around you, influencing, resting you, but the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you now. <sighs> Listen. <laughs> I'm just saying it's really real. It's a really listen, real listen, phenomenon that has happened listen, that is so me. I just, notable. I just want to say this. I know it's just like, what? Like, look, when when we're chrismated, when we're baptized and chrismated, the fathers are clear about this. And like, I'm not saying that doesn't matter that the fathers are clear about it because that's all that should matter. But what I'm saying is your experience is bearing out to that. There's a difference. You you're experiencing a what's quote let's say quote unquote a, phenom a phenomenological experience. You know what I mean? You're like, hey, what is this, right? And it's not because I'm trying to come off as like some Pollyanna, you know, Ricky Ricardo, like whatever type of thing, right? You have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, and the Father say like before Chris, like the gift that's bestowed upon you through chrismation after your baptism is the indwelling of the spirit versus the spirit re resting upon and working outward. You see what I'm saying? And so, oh, I know it's like scandalous for people, but oh, heavenly king, comfort, spirit of truth, who art present, fills to all things, treasure, blessings, giver of life, right? Oh, heavenly king, comfort, spirit of truth, who art everywhere present, fills to all things, right? Now, here's the thing. You could be like, yeah, but I was like confirmed Catholic and blah, blah, blah. But like, yeah, you were also doing what in between that time sure do you, do you understand what i'm saying so it's like sure. here, here's the other thing i'll just say this okay whatever oh whoa wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute yeah that doesn't even make sense with what the with what a chrismation is with 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 what the mystery of chrismation is doing why would you make a gap it doesn't make any sense to gap it out like that that's that would defeat the purpose, right? Yeah. To have that's, the gap. that's why we don't, right? It's, <laughs> that's why we oh, don't. That's so weird. That's why we don't. And so is that intentional? It's so uh, that... we we have a real problem with it. And that's why, you know, these practices of people, you know, like listen, baptism and chrismation is meant to be together. And the baptisms, you're we in baptism, there are prayers, there are ancient, ancient, ancient exorcism, prayers of exorcism that are prayed over the individual, and the individual is charismated and communed, like, boom, 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 like, that's how the church has done it, and, you know, um, we can get into this whole thing about exorcists falling out of, because there was an office of the exorcist that fell out of use, and that had to do with, basically, you know, as infant baptism became ubiquitous, there was no need for the office of exorcist anymore because, you know, society was, was who, who you're going to exercise. The babies are baptized and they're communing and like, you understand what I'm saying? Um, but the reality of how this impacts people, and I don't mean just like with demonic influence, but the experience of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, what, and what that means to experience the Holy Spirit, because I can tell you, I'm just from my personal experience, there's a huge difference between, and there's no doubt that I had some sort of experience and relationship with God and the Holy Spirit, because if I didn't, I would have never became Orthodox. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is the one who led me to the church, but there's a difference. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the resting upon, the working externally versus the internal you know, in dwelling, there's, there's a difference, you know, and it, and it isn't as necessarily sensational as people are thinking, which is part of the trap, right? Because that's, that's the thing is what you learn is how quiet 
and gentle the Holy Spirit is. Sure. Well, I wouldn't have even brought that phenomenon up, Father. It's not something that I would have like even why 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 would I mention that to somebody? Because it's just kind of a weird little thing that I've noticed and been like, okay, whatever. But then when I think about it, it's like, yeah, but what difference does that make over like 30 years? Yeah. Yeah. And so and so and so think about this. Think about a life of, you know, a span of, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years of confessing, communing, you know what I mean? Repenting. Yeah. Being a sinner. Yeah. Making mistakes, but like you're just keeping your, your foot forward or, or a, a lifetime. You know what I mean? Like I'm looking at my kids who are cradle. They've been in the church their whole life and seeing some of these things come to fruition, right? Like, and and it, and it isn't the signs of wonders. I mean, forgive me. I'm going to start a whole thing right now. But like, I am becoming more and more suspicious of like the charismatic stuff. I mean, I always have been, but it's just like, man, because as I'm growing, as so I'm as I'm growing in my relationship to the Holy Spirit and just seeing how how even misguided and wrong I had been as an evangelical and just, you know what I mean? And God continually purging me of my prelist and delusion and all those things and being like, whoa, 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 that was not the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? Sure. So, Father, I'm sorry. When you refer to the charismatic movement, what are you referring? Are you talking about the Protestant charismatic movement? Like the Pentecostals? Yeah, and like Pentecostalism okay. and, okay. and, and, you know. So, Father, are, are, and you're saying because of the subtlety, right? Because of the su- because of the subtlety as versus this crazy I mean, subtlety yeah. sort of railing on the ground. Like, yeah, if I may, if I yeah. may, a couple key things: sobriety, gentleness, um, you know, wisdom. You know what I mean? Like those those hallmarks are, yeah, subtlety. Mm-hmm. Father, that this this makes me want to. I wanted to tell you about this and this it seems like this is the moment that I'm supposed to to tell it to you because it happened on Sunday after Tipica it goes right to this and you know after we after we have Tipica we all come outside and we all we all eat and you know what I mean talk and whatever and so I was talking to you know the brothers who are here who are now catechumens and they were talking about some uh you know issues that they were having and thoughts of whatever and just wanting some advice and I forget the exact context, but my, my, my two daughters were sitting next to me and, you know, the three-year-old is sitting at the end and I'm talking to, to them. And, you know, we were talking about being able to discern something and, and say, uh, you know, was this Christ or was this not Christ? And well, I was talking about something and I said, yeah. And then, and you know, that's not Christ because, and immediately my three-year-old said, that's not Christ because he's God. And then she just kept eating. <laughs> and we all looked at each other like, well, okay, that's it. Thank you. We're done. Out of the mouth of babes. Out of the mouth of babes. That's exactly I what I babes. said. And I was just like, and I've told you several things like this where I'm just like, because yeah. this is my first time being around Orthodox cradle children. Yeah. So yeah. like these sorts of things will happen yeah. and it's just like, ah, and my wife just laughs at it. She just, you know, whatever to her. I mean, she's Russian to her. It's just, yeah. just like, ah, that's to what kids do. But to me, I'm like, I never know. Yeah. That's, that's some high theology coming out I mean, of that it's little the highest, child. It's the highest theology. It's the highest <laughs> theology, right? You know what I mean? Cause she's, she's, she's speaking straight from the spigot. It's like, yeah, that's kind of how like, I, we've struggled before because like my oldest Louise or Zenia is like um, she'll say things along the lines of like if she's in pain we'll say like pray or something like that she's like no 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 I don't want pretend people I want real people mm. you know and so she's like no 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 I, I don't I want someone to really come help me I don't want pretend people but like and so that that's troubling to my wife for obvious reasons but I think it's like this thing like because she's cradle it's like you know that feeling honey when you're in church and you feel like good and warm and peaceful and you know like 
she's like oh i know that i'm like yeah honey that's the presence of god like oh oh okay i know that she's like she has this whole thing and out of the mouths of babes i was like um she's like so how come we can't see god i was like well honey because we are not really ready to see god yet if we saw god we might get scared because he's so big and so powerful she's like oh so that's why we have icons i'm like that's why we have that's, have icons. Icons. that's it right there <laughs> this then, is what i'm talking about those just, kind of things man <laughs> driving to high v just driving to high v get my mind blown by my little four-year-old and she's like that's why we have icons i'm like absolutely and that's beautiful i mean and um but i there is something i wanted to ask father about but i can't remember what it was um it had something to do with the um uh about uh, so saying the names lord in vain i just wanted to touch on that really quick again oh, that's, yeah that one will definitely shut down the factory yeah because it's familiarity breeds contempt right mm -hmm. i thought i heard you say that a long time yeah. ago like if you're just saying it like constant like just whispering it not out of a prayerful thing but like saying you know like the lord's name to represent like that is so stupid you know yeah. like if someone does something you're just like oh and then you do it yeah i mean i would just encourage everyone like bust out muhammad you know <laughs> yeah oh muhammad come mm -hmm. on um yeah um that was not the real question i can't remember you guys vamp for a second. I gotta think. For Do a you second. have another? Yeah, I thought you. I have one questions. more question, but there was something I really did want to touch on. Um, all right, fine. I'll just find it. I gotta stop thinking about it. I'm sure it'll come to you. Hey, it always does, doesn't it? Let's come back to it. Yeah, I'm pulling up my royal path stuff right now. So, how's you guys' week been? Pretty good. Yeah, it's did election day here. Hears interview, Andrew. Did I oh, see yeah. what? Did you see it? Do you see the John Hears interview? No, I haven't had no time yet. I'd I'd like to. There's a queue, and no offense, but that uh, Father Peter Hears and um, uh, Metropolitan Neophytus is at the top of the list. Yeah. So you guys are a close second. So so good, man. That yeah. one was. I'm looking Ooh. forward. I haven't heard. I haven't seen it yet either. Looking. The problem forward. is, is I sit down and read it. And like that's gonna be tough because a lot of the times like I do stuff while I'm doing other oh. stuff. So it's me having to like sit down and actually like uh da da da. But I am watching that documentary on the Rockefellers that you sent me. Sipping. Oh yeah, very good. Absolutely. Well, fa father on the Metropolitan Neophytus uh video, a weird experience with that one. I was watching and it was just like something was happening my head was getting like I, I, it was, it was, I was just getting spun off of this thing and I was just like I was in some kind of a, a zone he had put me in some kind of a zone and I was like how long have I been watching this have I been watching this for like half hour I was looking around like ooh, I was really engrossed I'm watching a half hour eight minutes eight oh, minutes wow. yeah eight minutes. he's wow. the man <laughs> I was he's like what is going on wow. that's the only way I can describe Metropolitan Neophytus is he's the man like yeah. he's the dude every time that dude opens his mouth i try and listen so this is this is something that i think we've touched on before but again it came to me and it was like man this is a good question because i struggle with this a little bit uh not really i'm actually probably fall a little bit air to the right so praying or slash not praying with the heterodox by garrett uh garrett thank you so much for sending this in um him and his wife are current, uh, currently catechumens, recently learned that you're not supposed to pray with non-Orthodox. Like, no prayer at all ever, period. Is there a royal path with this, or is it strictly black and white? Now that we're becoming Orthodox, we never go to another wedding or funeral outside of someone from the church. Um, honestly, we didn't realize it till right now, but my wife's sister is getting married. I think he, like, sends out, like, a situation that actually he might, like, turn off some of his family and some of his wife's family by saying like we can't attend or pray because of we're now orthodox da 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 um and then i'm making sure i get the wholeness of the prayer um the prayer one for everybody saying i mean i can answer it real quick i mean that that's kind I, of simple. sure keep going i'm making sure i'm answering the yeah. wholeness of the so question like the first thing is is obviously talking to his priest you know what i mean like and really getting direction from the priest because it, it's a nuanced answer 
But in a real general sense, that canon really nowadays needs to be applied, you know, in tiers. It's it's it should be much more strict for hierarchs and clergy, you know, because uh, we're living in an Amer in a America is not an orthodox country, right? It's a secular Protestant country, so the majority of people are going to come from families that are not Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And if they have any Christian background at all, the right thing to do would be to be, you know, number one, talk to your spiritual father or your priest. Number two, follow your conscience. Number three, you know, be charitable without, without compromise. Mm. So what I mean by that is this, you know, there's lines where it's like, yeah, the hero, like, that's fine. You know, it's like you, you go, you, you know, you thank God for the love that they have, you know, and you trust that ultimately Christ is going to be revealed in it and all that good stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, you're not the reverend, you're not officiating anything. You're not representing orthodoxy. Just chill out. Don't, don't worry about that. You know what I mean? Um, but there is a different question of like, you know, whether you're Orthodox or not, this question has come up for people about like, you know, my, someone's getting married to a partner or things like that. Like, those are questions that people are facing more and more now. Like, should I go to this civil union? You know what I mean? Where, or, or things like that. Like, that's a different question. Yeah. But, it, it, but it is in the same spirit in the sense that you have to, you know, approach it with, a, you know, a spirit of love. And I don't mean love as in like squishy, squishy, anything goes. I mean, love for God and the truth, <laughs> first and foremost, you know. And then, you know, obviously, if you have love for God and truth, that's going to extend to love for your neighbor. And sometimes that love for your neighbor is going to look look different. It's not always going to be like acquiescing to madness, you know. So I would just say, just to sum summarize again, talk to your priest, um, follow your conscience and realize that like you're not representing the church in any official capacity so it doesn't really apply in the in that in the that reading of the canon i think um is is inappropriate in that context especially since you're a catechumen but really anyone who's not clergy it's it's inappropriate you know um in, in this culture and in this time okay so uh i i i I'm going to not do that. I don't care. I'm not going to go down this road right now. We'll talk about that later. Father, I have the question. I have one thing that I wanted to say, and then I had the question I remembered. Like last week, you talked about um, the results of the prayer that you put in will be once the prayer is like finished, right? Like the, you're talking about the grace. So like the prayer itself will be difficult. And then after the prayer is like done and you're starting to go about your day, that's when the grace comes. Is that kind of what I heard you say like last week or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it, it's applied a couple of different ways, but the like, all right. So generally when that's brought up, it's the mistake people make is they're looking for some sort of effect, some sort of phenomenon it is. during yeah. the prayer. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it's like, you know, do you lift weights thinking like, okay, now I'm perfectly in shape now. It's like, no, who does that? You don't lift weights thinking you're going to be in shape while you're lifting weights. Okay, perfect. As a matter of fact, you're sore for a couple of days after if you do it right. You're going to actually be weaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you, Cyprian. And then the big question to send us home on, because I think this might take up the rest of the time, is a personal question from Andrew Funk. He's the host of this podcast. Is, Father, what do you think of the term hyperdox? Hyperdox meaning like people, and allow me to explain. This is the way I interpret it, even though I, I just asked you a question, and I'm going to go ahead and give my well, interpretation. Well, is this your word, or is this the word no, that, that this you're is a word traveling around? I mean, this is a word that people have thrown at me, you know? Really? Oh, okay. yeah. See, I think I'm getting something different from this word than what people are saying to you, Father. What hyperdox means to me is the cage stage. It's like, it's this idea of you found this thing 
and your so my hyperdocs looked like taking on a 20 minute prayer rule when i first became orthodox fasting not according to uh what my uh spiritual father had been telling me um and like uh uh basically start walking around like you're a heretic you're a heretic you're going yeah to- yeah yeah i mean that's part of it and it can it, it can kind of go left right up and down from there i mean sure. isn't it isn't it zealotry isn't yeah. that so basically what we're talking it's, about it's essentially being being zealous. Zealous, being being zealous you know not according to experience but according to like information according to knowledge yeah so according- like yeah, I, I mean, because I don't it's a little, it, look. It's a little term, and people most of the times, most people who I hear throw that around, are people who. <laughs> I mean, I hear it from people who, you know, they, their their comprehension and their comprehension and apprehension of the faith is is more akin to seeing the faith as like you know a very quaint exotic expression of christianity because they're you know they're they're too sophisticated to you know the stuff we've talked about before like they look at the elders is that's all just you know crude village sophistos yeah they're sophistos you know or they're or they're very liberal they're like or so like yeah i mean generally speaking someone who throws generally there's always exceptions right but generally speaking someone uses that term that just makes me think like i well i'll put it this way uh you know if if my uh if my kid is sick i'm not asking them to pray <laughs> you know what i mean i'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not asking that person to pray because they're you know what i mean they'll, they'll be like oh you know they i find their lack of faith disturbing <laughs> So. Nice, nice. So, what would be the actual critique on a catechumen who's made a catechumen who won't like, in a bad way, kind of shut up about stuff? Well, um, like, who won't chill out? Yeah, you're proud, you're vain, you're deluded. Um, you need to be smacked around. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I like, have literally said that to people before, where there's been a person who's grumbling about someone who maybe is taking this kind of like attitude towards orthodoxy of being like, I can't, I, I don't know the words for it. it, just doesn't feel authentic. And I'm like, they'll, they'll coming into their baptism and all this different stuff. And they've literally been like, man, I kind of wish that dude would just be quiet. I'm like, let God humble him. Like, let it happen. I mean, that see that right there. You know, you've you've earned a biscuit for that one because that's let God humble them. Like, I love that. If we could live by that, if we could, I mean, because that's the kingdom of God. Let God humble them. You know, but I, I would say this: the reason why I came down on that because, generally speaking, from my experience, which I have much experience in this, is like. The, that term hyperdox is yeah i you see it thrown around for like the the wet behind the ear eager like catechumen but a lot of times it's used for it's it's employed by people who find themselves you know in a much more materialist academic you know kind of sophisto they they tend to throw that at people who are like oh yeah, that priest over there, he does daily services, hyperdox. Like that's oh yeah. You know, it, it's it's a term that is often used to marginalize people who are pious, people who 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 are traditional. You know, that that's what I that's what I see. Saint Nectarios would be called a hyperdox in his day or something like that. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's like it's I like mean, a fundamental to say fundamentalist in a pejorative way. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Christian. So for the and so yeah, so for the catechumen and stuff like that, it's like, or the young or the person who's really zealous, like yeah, you could apply, you could say it in that sense, but they're just really zealous, and I just think, I mean, I'm guilty of it. It's one of those things that I I want to do better, better, you know, as a obviously as a priest, everyone knows I'm a bad priest, but you know, being careful not to throw, you know, 
you get carried away. It's late night. You know, you're on your podcast, you're yapping, whatever you can say names. But like, I, I, at the end of the day, I'm, I really want to move away from it because of the very reason, like I was saying earlier, I don't want my prayer hindered. You know what sure. I mean? And so things like that, they just, they're not beneficial. Um, it seems, it, it, I, I get the, the idea that it's a misapprehension. I get why you see it, say it's a misapprehension because it's like, I wonder if the same person who would say, oh, they do daily services would says the same thing about 24 hour pharmacies. Hmm. Right. Yeah. That's hmm. a great, that's a great, yeah, that's good. That's right. Great. I'm sure they that they're happy you know that there's they 24 hours. I'm sure <laughs> they they're don't. happy that yeah. there's 24 yeah. hour pharmacies. Right. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure they're very happy. Like, but then it's like, who needs to get a prescription filled at 4 a.m.? And it's like, no, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Actually, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you do need a prescription filled at 4 a.m. Like, yeah, sometimes you do need Vespers on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes yeah. you do. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah, that's great absolutely. Point. No, that's a, that's yeah. a good way of like. Um, hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. So, so yeah. So to kind of close that out, I mean, like, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's, I don't really, I don't really put much stock in it. It's not really worth much, you know? So. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It was just, it was something that I heard from another Orthodox YouTube channel and I liked it because at the time I could relate to it, but I could see now some of the negative connotations of it, of it being used against genuinely. Oh no, I'm just trying to live like an Orthodox life. You mean you pray daily? It's like, well, yeah. You know, I mean, I kind of got it, but it's not because I want to, it's just because I kind of got it because I'm, I'm a mess otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, So hold on. Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's spend a little time on that because this was a conversation that came up on Sunday. Okay. Right. <clears throat> And this this idea, because there's a, there's a subtlety there to what you said, and I don't want it to just go by, right? Like, it's not what you want, but it's what you've got to do because of kind of the greater want of not wanting to be a mess, right? So it's like, oh, wait, did, did you guys freeze? No, no, there. no I'm listening. <laughs> this, is, this is what came up, and Father, maybe this is something that we could – we could dig into is like a conversation happened on Sunday that was about we're just we're just talking about and just throwing back and forth like this idea of of discerning maybe future future actions like of course first talk to talk to your spiritual father talk to a priest but pray but in discerning actions and this idea of like when things don't match up with what we want mm -hmm. but like we're praying we're we're leading a christian life and we want certain things in terms of we see a progression for ourselves in those certain things like and maybe it's a very maybe it's a very virtuous thing like maybe it's something like cler becoming clergy right mm -hmm. maybe it's like i want to become a priest right mm -hmm. this question of like discerning god's will mm -hmm. even if perhaps it comes that like in prayer in mm -hmm. that discernment mm -hmm. it seems to run contrary to what it is that we've laid out for ourselves that we want that seems to be very virtuous in terms of our life as a christian does that make sense like what i'm asking yeah, i mean i mean you know just it would it be would it be appropriate for me to throw out a couple of things to help just generally to discern yes stuff? go ahead so like again kind of default talk to your spiritual father now let me unpack that real quick because i realize more and more i don't know if this is i won't say most there's a lot of people who don't have a quote-unquote spiritual father that that's that's the first thing and so like you know talk to your godfather talk to talk to the oracles in your life you know what i mean Father, uh, so this that. doesn't have to be clergy necessarily. This could be it, another Orthodox person. Yeah, like, so let me just kind of give a general help. Because, like, this is, like, field, this is the field manual, I think, kind of field manual time, right? So most people don't have, okay, man, 
this how much time do we got so like <laughs> no this is good this is good i know this will okay. help a lot of people okay so first of all there's there's the thing of like the spiritual father well what is a spiritual father right we this is like episode number one right i think we talked about this right mm-hmm. like, that yeah absolutely i think it was episode number two yeah, yeah number very two, important maybe. so like the spiritual father is is someone who in the fear of God in faith and love has, you know, drawn near to you in your life. And they are consistently used by God to help you in a life of repentance and prayer and love and, 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 and life in Christ. Okay. Typically speaking, generally speaking, it'll be a priest. But many people's spiritual father may not be priests. It may be, you know, that some people have deacons as spiritual fathers or they're, you know, it, it's a monastic, you know, typically speaking, that's what it is. But, you know, you may not be in a position where you have that, where you have a spiritual father who's a priest or a monastic or clergy or something like that. And you may just have a relationship developing with like the priest at your parish that hears your confession, right? And so I would just say, kind of nurture that. And, you know, don't come to that priest and put on him a yoke that he's not necessarily putting out there for you. So don't think that every priest is a spiritual father and want, and want or wants to be yours, right? And so here's something I just want to say real quick. Keep me on the path, by the way. Keep me on the path. Don't let me go too far on the, uh, the rabbit trail. But, you know, something that's come up a couple times um, actually, it, it's it's come up a handful of times in the last two weeks, and I just want to say this to people. I really think it's a bad idea, and I understand it because of the kind of the desert people are in spiritually. Do not go around asking multiple priests and multiple people their their input on your personal situation. Mm. Mm. Don't, don't don't do that. It's it's very bad. Um, not only do clergy like not like that, but it's just it's just a bad idea. It causes problems for the person spiritually. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks in the kitchen, and it's a great source of confusion. And it's a great it's a great tool that the enemy can use in your life. So I would just tell someone, generally speaking, don't do that. If you don't have a quote unquote spiritual father, pray for one, and in the meantime. You know, speak to the priest that's hearing your confessions or the one who's catechizing you, right? Or if you're really struggling in that area, talk to your godfather or your godmother. You know what I mean? Talk to the person who God's put in your life to help you navigate these things. Or if that's a or if that's a struggle, you can't right? talk to your spouse. You know what I mean? If if your spouse is a God fearing, you know, obviously, right? Sure. Um, and then because these are what I would call like the oracles, they're the ones who if, if you're prayerful and you're really authentically seeking God and with a broken and contrite heart, God will speak through these people, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's carte blanche. You know what I mean? You're not a monastic, so you, there isn't some kind of uh, obedience that you think you're entering into that would be inappropriate, right? There's It has to be taken with, with a measure of, of humility and sobriety. But generally, this is what you can do. The other thing that people often um, overlook is the reading of scripture. The reading of scripture is like the number one way to hone your means of discernment. Because so many things that people ask about this and that, I just want to be like, well, you know what I mean? Like, just be like, this is, it's just, this is what the scripture says. You know what I mean? And then, you know, after, after the scriptures, then you have, you know, um, the the hymnography of the church, the writings of the fathers, you know what I mean? Spiritual books. These are great ways to kind of, you know, help in the process of discerning, you know what I mean? And if you're doing, if you're doing those things consistently with prayer and fasting and just kind of living an orthodox life of repentance, then you'll find it becomes very easy. Now, all that being said, I don't want to say very easy. Forgive me. It's never easy. It's simple. It becomes very simple. Now, all that being said, I would say this. There's a couple of key things, you know, I'll just give out all the secrets, whatever. But 
uh, generally speaking, if you're trying to find God's will, you need to look for a couple things. Number one, where's the cross? Because that's generally speaking where God's will is, and that's generally where people don't want to go. So when you're dealing with something like, hey, this is a very quote unquote virtuous good thing. Okay, well, um, where's the cross in it? Right? Because that that's that's where you'll really know like what the situation is. So for instance, it's A or B, right? And B sounds so great, and people will look at me and they'll love me and they'll think I'm pious and lovable. But A is like. I'll be doing this very difficult thing for the love of someone. No one's going to know. I'm going to go unnoticed and I'm going to be humiliated probably. Well, guess what? Eh, that's nine times hard. out of 10, it's option A, the cross. You know what I mean? That That's where that's where God's leading you, you know? So, so that's another thing for discernment. Another thing in regards of discerning things is asking God to close doors. Oh, my favorite. You know, just, yeah. I've been doing that lately and it's, it's just, it's incredible. It works. It actually works. It actually works. It's, it's actually, incredible. It actually, it's, it actually works, you know? So like, I mean, there you go. I'm, it's, you know. I, I literally had one anymore. happen today. Uh, I literally, been nice I literally you, have. It's been nice knowing you guys. So, you know, like my job is done. The, the, this project has been great. It's been great knowing everyone. It's been great meeting people. <laughs> um. Oh, turbo basically shiny, after man. this like everything i've said just now you don't ever need to reach out to me because if you just apply that there you go yeah my uh my baptizing priest i went back um a long time ago to and he served a liturgy and his his after liturgy you know word was he's like you notice that eucharist is at the very end i'm, I'm not gonna try and do impersonation but it, in, imagine a very very excitable small arabic man and he's um he's talking he's like the eucharist is at the very end of the liturgy because you can't do anything more that's it that's the best that's what he gives you or well, after that we wrap it up we wrap it up we're done like because yeah. that's the best you can do is that right there yeah. and he spoke like on um needing to understand this dude is he is who he is but he's constantly asking like where's the cross where do i need to be what do you need me to do well, i mean that's just that's oh. just that's the faith. That's the faith. And, and I, I think, listen, I think this, this question about like discerning God's will is important, but I think the problem is, is like, oh man, you know, God doesn't really care in the way that people think he cares. You know what I mean? Like he cares about every little detail for sure. But at the same token, it's kind of like people think God cares whether you're wearing Gucci or like Prada and like he doesn't, you know what I mean? He he's looking at these other things that are that are way more indicative of like where is your heart? You know what I mean? Like where is your heart in this thing? And I just find forget everyone else in my own life things are simple and clear, which is I'm always striving for clarity, simplicity, wisdom, accuracy in the shadow of the cross. But like, I, you know, I guarantee you like clickety clackety, everybody put the comments in. But if you really are honest, you stop and reflect in your life, the times in which you've been most frustrated and, and you have felt most out of control and things have been most complicated is when you're avoiding the cross, is when you're avoiding that kind of like death to self, you know what I mean? And I, I just think, if you stop and reflect on that, what you'll find is that what's being said here is true. And the good news is you have a path forward, but the bad news is, is like, you know, it's a painful one, but that's, that's the, the way of our master. And I guarantee you that pain, just like the pain of the, 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 the triathlon and the staying up all night to, to cram or like whatever the pain is to get that goal. It's, I mean, no pain, no gain. You know, I hate to use the wisdom of the world like that or, you know, kind of like pithy statements, but there's there's truth in them. And this it it applies especially to the spiritual life, you know. And if we're wanting to know God's will, here's the thing. Well, I'll say this too. You need to really separate. It says in Jeremiah, 
that when you separate the precious from the worthless, then you'll be my, then you'll become my servant. And too many people they have mixed in with their will, like what they think God's will is or God's will, you know what sure. I mean? Like that you have to really do the process of unmixing and mingling and taking out, you know, your will, which is worthless. You know what I mean? And and really and so everything I just kind of talked about, hopefully will help at the very least help people to see more clearly what where their will is so they can pursue God's will. Hmm. That's really, yeah, that's really good coming from like a um a job that's primarily Protestant based. You know, it's obviously if things are going well, then it's God's will. And I'm like, mm, mm, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's that kind of prosperity gospel type of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's it's it, it is very interesting that like the juxtaposition there of like a Joel Osteen type, right? Yeah. Who's For always real. talking about God's going to open doors. He's going to open doors. He's going to open doors. And then the orthodox idea of like, no, 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 you should be praying that he closes them for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, not not one cross in that man's church. Like, uh, isn't like, that weird? Yeah. <laughs> there's not one cross. cross. Like, is it weird? Isn't there a gold, a giant golden angel holding a globe or something, though? Isn't that what's behind? And yeah. I think that's what's behind on his stage. Wow. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, there is. I think there is a globe. Somebody could correct me on that. And I think there's an angel holding it. I don't know. That's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things like Cyprian you talked about. It was Jack Parsons, right? That said Jack like, Parsons. Yeah, yeah they were uh, like, JPL. Yeah, they were like, um, how do you get your ideas? Like, oh, I do occult magic, yeah. and I summon a demon, and he tells me what to do. And all the reporters like, <laughs> but I'm like, no. He's saying what he's doing. Like I he's he like actually he's, was. Yeah. That's and, actually what he was doing. Like yeah. he was very, very open about it. There was no question. I think there's like uh I think this is an okay thing to end the show on, but uh a couple of the people from my work, uh residents, they went to go visit the Church of Scientology, uh, because that's a big one in Kansas City. Um, they have like a pretty big Wait, parish. Scientology is big in Kansas City too now. Yeah. They took oh. over a building downtown, the Scientology sign from a certain perspective as part of the cityscape, the quote unquote skyline, oh. quote unquote. And um, it's got a pretty big presence there. And actually, we were walking into the farmer's market and they were standing. Wait, outside. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Andrew. Just to just to combine these, you know, that L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons were boys, right? Is that why you brought it up? Yeah, that's exactly okay, why I brought sorry, it up. I'm that's sorry. Exactly I just, just wanted I to, okay, yeah. just wanted to make sure. They were both hanging out in Pasadena with all yeah, the Yeah, I think people. didn't yeah. one of Jack Parsons' wife leave him for L. Ron Hubbard? I think that might be right. Like that. There's something that like right. that. Yeah. There's yeah, yeah. a close connection there. Um, but they were, uh, of course, I can't remember what it is called right now. What's the thing? Di diametrics? They, Dianetics. Dianetics. Dianetics, thank you. Dianetics, they're handing out pamphlets outside of... Um, uh, the river market and people were being nice and accepting and throwing them away like whatever down the street but like uh when they offer one to me i was like absolutely not get that stuff away from me like i was like like grab my wife and shoved her to the other side i was like kids stay over there wife stay over there absolutely not don't give me any of that stuff and the guy was like oh sorry i was like yep goodbye like i was like i absolutely will have none of that thank you but um good for you they went, they went, and even some of the people that were there um, that are not terribly faith-minded, like in the sense that like their, their their view on God is very secular, they were seeing the uh the spell. Like they chose like the youngest, prettiest girl that they had, probably at the whatever it is. I don't want to say parish, but whatever it is. And she was the guy center. They call it a center, the center Scientology center. And they were like, we're walking people through. And as they're walking through, like it started out very secular, all the things that Scientology has done for the community. And as they're walking further and further in, it started to get like, well, actually, if you really look at it, a lot of the stuff that we say makes sense. And then as it got further, it's like, so how much are you going to give? How, so when, when can we sign you up? Like, do you want to do it today? Do you want to do it now? We can do it now. It's absolutely fine to do it now. You know, like, and even they were seeing it. Like they were seeing it as like, 
And of course, there's like this whole part dedicated to like the black Scientologists and all the things where that the Scientology community has done for the black community and stuff. It was like if I weren't avoiding that place like the plague, I'd be very curious to see what was going on in there. But like, I absolutely will not go near that building and grifting. That's what's going on in there is grifting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Grift, old fashioned grifting and grifting and cult oh, behavior. Man. Oh man, you get a you get a. <laughs> You get a biscuit for using grifting. <laughs> That's two biscuits in the show. That's great. <laughs> this is a two biscuit R- show. Hanging out. I mean, I lived in Hollywood for long enough. Like that, that group of folks is something else. It's a, it is nothing good. It's, it's a lot of delusion. A lot. It just seems like every, if you just take every passion and just slam it all together. And then you're just like, here we are. Let's put a our cross building purple it. and come on in. Put a cross. I don't think they it. have any crosses. I don't think they have any. Crosses. Oh, their their symbol is a cross with like the four diamonds coming out on each intersection. Oh, is cross. it? Yeah, it, they have oh. a, in their big headquarters. They have a giant golden cross with uh, each section. I I don't know if there's some. Oh, I think it's a compass, isn't it? Like a compass rose. Well, because they're they're like a naval thing. They have like this whole naval motif that they do. I don't know. Maybe I'm out of my element here. It it yeah. it's, the bar Crazy. the bar up here. It's not right here. Oh really? Right there. Yeah. Oh, I have to. No, I won't go. I won't go look. No, at it don't. Anyway. It's not waste your. It's not worth your time. It's it's about the most horrible thing. Anyway, um. Okay, folks. I I could try and squeeze another ten minutes out of this, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> you know, this Jerry Seinfeld says that you should know when to get off stage, and I'm gonna get off stage now. Fair so, enough. um. All right, so the usual, except this time, I'm going to shout out to Jack. Jack, thank you so much. Jack is the person who submitted thumbnails that we're going to be start using. I'm going to start shouting out to him. Thank you very much for the thumbnails. We haven't uploaded them yet, but during wait, the- where was I supposed to upload the thumbnails that he already sent? During the course of this show, Jack okay. shared a folder with me. Oh. During the course of this show, I remembered I forgot to share it with you. Got so it. Okay, you perfect. have an email waiting for you um, oh, wow. when you're done, uh, okay. when we're done here. I um, uh, want to uh, talk about the uh, Royal Path podcast music is a playlist on Spotify. If we mention something on the show, I generally try and put it on the podcast uh, or on the playlist, Royal Path playlist or Royal Path podcast playlist or something like that. You'll find it on there. Um, Links then in I the want- description. Link is in the description. There you go. Um, uh, also, our store, Royal Path Thought Store. That's yep. Correct. Okay. Nailed it in one. And then if you uh, have questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I will pass it along or read it on the show at Andrew at RoyalPath.net. Work. Um, network. Oh, gosh, dang it. I'm never, <laughs> I'm going to get this. Down. I'm going to write it down on the side of my computer or something one day. Andrew at RoyalPath.network. This is email dot network um and otherwise thank you very very much and thank you for having a good night bye-bye